Welcome to this episode of Eureka. We are with us a very interesting person, Dr. M. Ravi Kumar, Director of Institute of Seismological Research, Ahmedabad. A distinguished seismologist, Dr. M. Ravi Kumar hails from Hyderabad. He completed his academics from Osmania University. Mr. Kumar specializes in seismology, solid earth geophysics and numerical modeling. Many of his papers have been published in renowned journals. Currently, Dr. Kumar is working on earth dynamics and earthquake early warning technology. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being in this uh, program for joining with us. My pleasure. Let me uh, start with some question that usually I ask uh, the uh, guest of this program. Like, uh, where were you born? What was the kind of your uh, upbringing, childhood? Yeah, Can you say something about it? Yeah. I was born in Hyderabad. Um, and then the whole family was kind of in Hyderabad and we grew up in Hyderabad. My schooling, everything was Hyderabad. I think I have never gone out of Hyderabad for anything, right from the uh, lower classes to the PhD, everything uh, totally. I mean, Hyderabad. including PhD, you did Yes, yes, including PhD, I, mean, I did. Obviously, because uh, NGRI, the, yes. uh, one of the world famous institute yeah. is there in uh, Hyderabad. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, what did you do? Your college, your master's? Uh, my master's was in Usmania University. Mm -hmm. And my B.Sc. Honours was again from the Usman University in a different college. So, as I said, everything, everything, in, was everything is, in, is in Hyderabad. Then PhD, I, I joined NGRA and then did my PhD. So, I became a scientist and then did my PhD. PhD from again, PhD. got uh, the award from Usman because NGRA itself cannot yeah, issue uh, it. It was a PhD. research uh, institute, yes, yes. but you do the research there, but then the PhD is awarded by Usman University. Yes. You were born in 1964. When you were about 18 years, that was in 1982, there was a earthquake in Usain Sagar and it was a talk of the town. Yes. Do you remember the time? Yeah, in fact, I very vaguely remember that because, you know, we didn't know about earthquakes until that thing happened because we were not into earthquake science at that time. And then we realized there was a panic in the whole city. We heard people were running away from, uh, from Usman Sagar and then that kind of evoked some curiosity in me. I mean, Firstly, I came to know about the word earthquakes in 1982, January, February, I remember and it was all very funny then I thought there is something uh, that we need to, you know. That we need to know beyond, yeah. Yeah. it's not there in the textbook or yeah. anything that you have not yeah. heard but then there is yes. some very, yes. something which is, uh, yes. you know, creating uh, panic. panic. Yeah, and at that time the, uh, the syllabus did not contain much about uh, the earth science, earthquakes and all. Right now, probably there is a lot of uh, curriculum more. that includes this, but at that time we didn't have it, so that probably was a trigger. I mean, now, if I think back, and then <laughs> you you can see that there is some connection yeah, between that probably, and uh, yeah. perhaps your current uh, career. Yeah, probably, that is probably, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's interesting. I mean, uh, how uh, some incident in our life affects us. You had worked on uh, geophysics, which is looking at uh, the dynamics of Earth. You know, I mean, we all know. Like uh, there is cyclone, there is heavy wind, there is uh, maybe dust storm. You know, I mean, atmospheric uh, changes is something that uh, we in intense. I mean, uh, intrinsically know. When you say dynamics of geophysics, what are they? Are they just only earthquakes? No, actually, uh, we need to get a bit sensitized here that the Earth holds the key for whatever life there is on the Earth. Okay. I, mean, I mean, the. I mean, the whole life actually sustains on how the earth is working, right from uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, water, minerals, we call them plumes or we, some of the exotic landscapes, the climate, the weather, everything is controlled by the earth. You see, if the Himalaya was not there, mm. then the dynamics of the climate and atmosphere would be different because the winds that flow in would not change get deflected direction. or change direction and then do things that they are doing today. So, Actually, the earth, atmosphere and the ocean are a coupled system. I feel that the earth holds the key here. Yeah, yeah central uh, pivotal yes. point. And this is one of the least understood, you know, uh, understood mediums uh, in the whole universe. Yeah, so we need to now do something to understand our earth 
much better than what we do. I feel that the whole thing is connected. What happens deep inside the earth at the core mantle boundary, which is 2,890 kilometers deep to the surface. 2,890 kilometers deep, deep, something like about 3,000 kilometers yeah, deep. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. happens there, actually the plumes, it is understood that the plumes actually are born at the core mantle boundary. Plumes are like uh, uh, boiling material yeah, that is coming material, out, hot, hot material, material that is kind of coming up. Exactly. No? And you know, and at other places, I mean, we talk about, I mean, all our women are so fascinated about diamonds. Mm -hmm. These diamonds are actually transported from deep inside the earth by thing called uh, kimberlites. Mm -hmm. So, it is a pipe. Mm -hmm. So, it is a pipe which very quickly transports these diamonds. Onto so, the, the diamonds are made there and then it yeah, comes up. The yeah, diamonds are formed deep inside the earth. They are brought up. So, we wear diamonds without even realizing where they are born. You know. <laughs> so, we earth scientists actually try to understand the whole earth as a system and see which areas are more likely to have which minerals, where is water depleting, where is water getting enriched, and where is oil, how is it migrating. So, if we understand the migration of oil itself, that will save billions of dollars for the oil industry. Oil so, yeah. uh, you got perhaps uh, unconsciously inspired by that Hussein Sagar, uh, you know, incident, that earthquake. Maybe it was not earthquake, maybe a major tremor uh, and then, uh, but of course, unknown place when it happens, I mean, it causes panic and then perhaps uh, spurred you into the direction of earth sciences. What was your area of work when you did your PhD? I mean, that would have been very long back, but still. Yes, like, uh, uh, I am a hardcore seismologist. So, uh, I looked at the uh, active tectonics of the Burmese arc, which is the eastern part of the Indian plate and the Andaman arc. So, this was a relatively less studied region at that time and again it was a bit unique because what we propose is a new mechanism where we said that there is a change in tectonic scenario from a subduction to a strike slip environment. So, uh, that was long back because at that time we were interested in integrating the space observations with the ground observations and uh, do some plate motion modeling kind of stuff. So, so which means that uh, when you are doing your PhD, I mean that is a kind of uh, break uh, through in the sense that I mean you are using space uh, information, images and data kind of first time to look at uh, yeah, I, in I, India I, in that, that area. That is where we started because in, uh, in uh, late 1980s, uh, the Indian government was very excited about uh, doing a program called very long based on interferometry, where you could measure the distance between two points which are tens of thousands of kilometers apart to the accuracy of less than a centimeter. Less than a centimeter. centimeter. Mm -hmm. So, that is looking at the space, looking at distant stars, mm -hmm. but that did not take off the way uh, it, it was. was supposed to. Then we got slightly uh, deviated and uh, of course, eventually for my PSA, I could not integrate the space observations, but yeah, that it started there. It and started then, there. Yeah, right. and then I went into seismology and yeah, today I get fascinated about the whole seismology, uh, scale lengths ranging from very large to very small, right from the earth's deep interior like core mantle boundary to the surface. That it is it all fascinates me because one day I would like to integrate everything. You think it. Yeah. Nice. It is a very interesting conversation and we are going to discuss something very, very interesting. Do you know there was a time when there was no Himalayas? That is a time that we are going to take you, but then that is after the break. So, do not go away, stay. We are having a very interesting conversation. Welcome back to this episode of Eureka and we are having a very interesting conversation with uh, Dr. M. Ravi Kumar. Thank you sir, we are having a very interesting conversation and then before the break, I said there was a time when there was no Himalayas. When was Himalayas formed? Himalayas was formed uh, roughly 50 to 55 million years. 50 from to 55 million years, that means about uh, 1 million is about 10 lakh, so about 500 lakh or 5 crore year ago, yeah, right yeah, roughly. Yeah, so, true. before that there was no Himalayas. There is no Himalaya. What was there? Uh, before that, there was a ocean ahead of India, mm -hmm. which is called the Tethi Sea, mm -hmm. which dug below the Eurasian plate as we call it. Mm -hmm. And then that vanished eventually and then the two plates got collided, the Indian plate, the hard part of the Indian plate and the hard part of the Eurasian plate got collided and then the Himalayas were You born. use a word like for example, plate and then uh, whenever you talk about something related to uh, geophysics, yeah. people talk about something called plate tectonics. Right. Uh, for our audience, can you explain this in a very simple way? 
Yes, actually uh, the plate tectonics is that we have some things called the mid ocean ridges where the plate actually takes birth. So, then a new lithosphere is created which is very thin and then it spreads away from the mid oceanic ridges then it, it loses its temperature then slowly there is a differentiation which happens and then the plate gets thicker. And then in it is called a Wilson cycle in about 200 to 20 million years the whole earth is recycled. So, 200 to 200? 20 million years. Million years. Yes. So, about uh, 20 crore years yeah. I mean there is a kind of a cycle. Yeah. What is in the top goes below and what yes, is in below exactly. comes up. Exactly. It is, it is like a conveyor belt where you know you take things away from the mid ocean ridge take it to the so it's like for zone. example you make a upma yeah you can see that uh, there is a you know thing below come up and right. come uh, so that's a kind of thing that is happening on yes. the earth also yeah. so what we see as stable is actually not stable it is yes. slowly moving yes because today we are here uh, if i am in ahmedabad today then maybe after a few million years i will be very close to the himalaya because i am actually going north this this uh, plate itself is uh, moving on yeah. the Right now it is moving, like India for yeah. example, right now is moving at the rate of 4 to 5 centimeters a year. 4 to 5 centimeters a year towards the north. Towards the north, yeah. So, which means that uh, when the Indian, India part is going towards north, then what happens in that edge? No, at, at the edge what happens is, when, when two plates collide or come together. Okay, what is the Indian plate? What is the other plate? The other plate is the Eurasian plate. Eurasian plate. Or the Asian plate as we call it. Okay. The, where the China, Russia, right. no that, that yes. uh, okay. Yes. okay. Yes. Uh -huh. so, so, when they both move to each other. What, what happens is, uh, whichever is dense mm -hmm. has to bend, has to duck down. Okay. So, it bends and then it goes below the less dense yes. Uh, yes. medium and then this gets down. But if you have uh, comparable densities of the two plates like in Himalaya which is a continent continent collision then you know they would not want to budge easily then you know then you scrape off the top part of the the lighter part and then that goes into the mountain building and the slightly denser part will continue to go actually right now we know that Himalaya uh, the, the Indian plate has gone very very north up to up to Tibet almost it, it is below Tibet if Oh, so what we see on the top Tibet, but if you actually dig yeah. down and go inside it, there is a yeah. old Indian plate yes. uh, underneath. Yes. Yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah, and because this is going, that uh, whole region should also rising up. Yes, and, and then yes, and then you are accumulating crust, and then there is something called isostasy, where you know if you have too much of a lighter material, then it kinds of tends to boil up. Boil up. Yeah. So when India is to moving towards north, I mean the Indian plate is moving towards north, which also means that the Himalayas is growing up. Yes, Himalayan so every year the Himalayan uh, height yes, is uh, going is increasing. Up. Yes, but then as you know, you cannot continue to pile sand against a wall. Uh, there is ca something called an angle of repose. Beyond a certain limit, the whole thing will will actually kind of slip and then. So that is the slip that you see in Himalayas. That's not necessarily the slip that we see. The, what we see in the Himalayas is what we call uh, the thrusting, under thrusting, because the Indian plate is wanting to go down. But then there is a resistance because it is a continental material, so it wants to stick up. So then this creates a lot of friction. Friction at the surface of the two plates. Two plates. Oh. Then that generates very large magnitude earthquakes because you know uh, there is a lot of stress build up, and then you it wants to go, it cannot go. It cannot go. Oh. So then then stress is built up, and then it vents up the <laughs> stress in terms of earthquakes, very large earthquakes. See one of your work. Uh, which uh, perhaps uh, one can call as the Eureka moment in your uh, whole academic career and many people uh, kind of uh, cite you is uh, the fast drift of uh, Indian plate in Mesoic era. I mean that is how everybody uh, says it. Can you explain it to us? Actually, when we go back in time, like before 140 million years from today, if you go back. That is about 14 crore year ago. Yes. And then, okay. uh, then we had what is called the Gondwana land. Where Gondwana land. Yeah. India, Australia, Antarctica, Africa, they were all together. They were all patched together. All patched together. Okay. Uh, As to one single uh, one land One single mass. entity. Oh. To the, much to the south where now uh, Antarctica, yes, Australia okay. are all, they are all, they are all together. So, which means that uh, India is, was not in uh, where India is today in the globe. But where uh, much, roughly much uh, where Antarctica is today, yes. much much south. Much much okay. south. Okay. Uh, then what uh, happened is well, I mean, this. What is believed that there is a super plume, something okay. a very hot material, came and hit the bottom of the whole Gondwana land, and then then this got 
fragmented fragmented disintegrated then india started because once it got uh, detached from the gondwana land it started moving north okay then as there was some kind of a impulse and then yes, it started moving north started okay. moving north and as it started moving north it encountered various other plumes like india is very unique because it was touched by the maximum number of plumes i think mm -hmm. then what would have happened is I mean, this what we have proposed mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, which is to be tested further and okay. all that what we said was when india got touched at the bottom then it lost most of most of its heavy material that lies below okay. which is called the, the lithosphere is dense rigid so what we said was a, a large part of the lithosphere was taken away by this hot material then it became very light so once it became light it's like a paper boat which would race you know. fast. yes okay so, so it was moving fast it was moving fast it raced we we say it raced at exceptional speeds raced not raced. just uh, fast yes, raced race uh -huh. because in the history of plate tectonics indian plate had the maximum speed like like 18 to 20 cm a year which is 18 to 20 cm a year every so year. a 20 cm will be roughly like this yeah. you know in uh, every year uh, it moved, it moved, it moved so fast yeah whereas today the indian plate is moving something like about 4 uh, to 5 4 to 5 cm a year yes. you know, yes. that's a, that's a right. about 5 times 6 yes. times uh, yes. speed yes. that's very interesting yes. so the racing india yeah. i'm sure with the help of uh, scientists like you will race ahead but we need to take a very small break we'll come back after this break welcome back to this episode of eureka and we are having a very exciting conversation with uh, dr m ravi kumar we had a very interesting talk before the break about how india is race at one point of time even today it is moving in the towards north about 4 uh, to 5 cm a year let me come to your current uh, work you are heading a institute in gujarat which is a state government institute which was formed after the uh, tragic uh, bhuj uh, earthquake one question people ask me when i told that i'm going to interview you was that ask him can he predict earthquake yeah i wish we could but right now the state of the art is that we really cannot predict earthquakes we means not we people sitting in india but Anywhere in the world, it's a it's it's a global uh, yeah. it's a global issue that uh, we are still short of predicting earthquakes. So, so what do you do then? So what we do at the moment is we try to do mitigation. So mitigation, our, mitigation. So what we strive to do is, in the event of an earthquake, how to minimize the loss, first to human lives and next to the property. Okay. So see if we can achieve a zero kind of casualty uh, when in the event of an earthquake that's a very good achievement then we think of uh, minimizing the losses because we know what measures should be taken in the event of an earthquake so if we do the right way of construction then we can definitely minimize a lot of risk. so basically what people say the natural disasters do not kill uh, people it is the uh, human action which is actually uh, killing people so you mean to say that if we build right kind of building so the death can be uh, avoided perhaps even completely yes. eliminated yes, right that is quite uh, sure. so can you just elaborate on this point i mean like uh, what do you do for this purpose so actually uh, there is a big uh, program that uh, we uh, are very actively engaged in what we call microzonation 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 uh -huh. so what we can do is we can actually calculate the kind of accelerations mm -hmm. at a given point in the event of a earthquake okay. so then we we give kind of uh, seismic safety factors okay. for site specific uh, locations suppose somebody wants to build a uh, 50 story building building here then we will go and tell them how they should design their building for what acceleration they should design that that knowledge we have that we will do another thing we also do is we can we also advise people where to build how many stories because in the event not everywhere everything can exact be built. because yeah. actually the top soil is very critical mm -hmm. to how the destruction happens in the event of an earthquake two places which are equidistant from the earthquake hypocenter okay. will not get equally affected it it depends a lot on the local site condition so it is local site condition which is extremely critical so we integrate the local site condition into these simulations what we call ground motion simulations 
then we can tell them what acceleration they should design their building or a hospital or a railway bridge or you know any critical structure that knowledge is very well uh, so there basically are. what you are trying to tell to our audience is that after the earthquake if you see a critical building standing steady there is a invisible hand of uh, people like you yes there is people who have followed taken the right advice have survived people who have not taken the right advice have not survived so okay so this is one work that you are doing which is that uh, Suppose if an earthquake happens, how do you ensure that the structure that we build stands yes. and do not kill people? Right. That is one part of it. Suppose if earthquake happens, yes. what is your role? Uh, when the earthquake, in the event of the earthquake, then the role of the scientist per se is kind of not, not very. Then it is the role of the disaster management agencies. Uh, which have to you know make an evacuation plan, then they should know what is the best way to get people out of this and then that is slightly outside the and purview. For that you need to know very fast yes. where is the epicenter, right? That, that yes, you are absolutely right. That we know. In fact, uh, there is another very important thing that ISR does. It can actually uh, in near real time, mm. it can detect earthquakes very quickly and then disseminate the information. Then we hope that in future, we will be able to tell even before the wave reaches a particular site that this area is going to be affected. So, kindly evacuate or like what we are now um, working on like it is a new project that has just started what is called earthquake early warning system. Earthquake early warning, warning system. system. Yeah. So, the suppose there is an earthquake somewhere in Kutch, okay. then there are some critical structures in Ahmedabad. So, how do we safeguard them? So, how do we make sure that, okay, suppose there is a nuclear power plant, for example. How do we make sure that the nuclear power plant is kind of uh, shut off even before the destructive wave waves reach. come and reach that. So, this is being practiced in some countries, but in India, like this is the thing that we are now going to do in the future, like earthquake early warning system is, a, is an interesting thing because then you can at least save a lot of, because in the event of a nuclear power plant getting affected, it's, 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 it's a big, it's, big, big it's a much bigger uh, disaster. So, that measures are taken. See, I was told uh, after this institute was formed in Gujarat, that is in the wake of uh, Buj uh, earthquake, there is a large network of uh, monitoring stations which have been established so that you can uh, pinpoint the uh, location of uh, earthquake very accurately. Uh, can you elaborate on this? Like yes, that? actually, uh, what is being done here is like. We have a about a 60 station product, 60 station, 60 station yeah. network, which is all integrated, and the data comes to a central place here through VSATs, and then uh, very quickly we automatically analyze where the location of this earthquake is and the magnitude, because the magnitude is very critical to the kind of destruction that can take place. So then we send out uh, the earthquake parameters very quickly within minutes. It's being sent to all the concerned all the authorities. Then okay, if the earthwork is large, then we have to think uh, what measures have to be taken. And we are also working towards how to prepare near real time shake maps. Shake map means how much a ground would shake due to this earthquake this at different locations. So, then uh, you can uh, give early warning to those yes, places. Yes, early warning to uh, those much, places. Yes. And I was also told that uh, with your uh, kind of uh, network that uh, earlier it took about two hours to uh, identify where was the epicenter, but then now you can do it within about 10 to 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, so, which means that uh, the relief material can reach the, uh, you know, most affected place very quickly. Yes. I mean, uh, administrative decisions can be taken uh, yes, much faster. Absolutely. So, which essentially points out to the fact that if we apply science and then uh, apply it uh, with uh, full willpower, political will, then we can save life. Yes. Is that what you are saying? Yes. So, now it is just a matter of making the right policy and ensuring that people actually do the right construction practices because it is very very important. In the event of an earthquake in the Himalaya, I mean it is a lot of our pop urban population lives in the indo gangetic plains which are which very can be very vulnerable, vulnerable to, to, to these earthquakes. So, we need to put the policy in place, tell them that okay, this is how it should be done. See the middle of last century, that is about 1950s. Uh, 
people started to call that as the space age, the birth of space age. I mean, uh, there was uh, euphoric uh, views about the space, going to space, you know, studying planets, which is very interesting, which has given us a lot of insight. But uh, I think as we are going towards 21st century, I think we should look down, right? So, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think we need to, like we talk about a, Earth, uh, a Mars mission or a Venus mission or a Moon mission, the time to get into an Earth mission. Moon, Earth mission? Earth mission. So what we, is it? The Earth mission is like uh, launching a big multidisciplinary program to explore the Earth right from the deep interior onto the surface. That's what I call it. And this integration would involve space technologies, big data, powerful computing, where we can simulate the response due to an earthquake very quickly. Because, you know, even our simulations, if you want to do a near real time simulation, then we need very powerful computing. Then we should be able to do uh, uh, tsunami warnings. Because the earthquakes also, earthquake in the, in the, in the sea, also can cause uh, destructive tsunamis, which can affect uh, power plants, which are mostly situated on the, uh, on the coast. So, I would call it now is the time to integrate the whole thing, space, terrestrial and deep, deep, earth, inside. deep earth observations, integrate them, get the, uh, mm, get the people who, who can do the programming and then parallel processing, multitasking, data integration. That is, that is going to be the future because tomorrow mm, we know that water is depleting. So, which are the regions which are getting critically depleted? which are the regions which are getting enriched. So, where should people go and look for water? Where is the oil moving? How is it migrating? So, fluid migration inside the earth itself is a very big science because it, that controls the whole life cycle of, uh, uh, of, us. Yeah, of the civilization. So, yeah. we need to embark on an earth mission. People like Dr. M. Ravi Kumar and the institutes like Institute for Seismological Research are in the forefront of it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us in this uh, program. We had a very lively and interesting uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.